will now call on our first panelist, Mr. Vince Doria. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, you know, I should start, I guess, with a, a bit of full disclosure here. I worked for ESPN for uh, 23 years. In that time, the network became the largest rights holder of college football games, uh, aired a much higher volume of college basketball games than any other network. Uh, so ESPN had a lot to do with generating the revenue that has turned these two sports into a large entertainment industry. Uh, uh, on their part, uh, ESPN, uh, through advertising revenue, subscription revenue, made a lot of money on this investment which in turn helped pay my salary. So I have, a, I have, a, I have had and have had a, a vested interest in the success of these two sports. You know, I should also note that uh, both Joe and Andrew have studied this topic uh, closely uh, for years now. They've written extensively about it. They're clearly better versed than I am in this area. And Matthews uh, is one of the foremost experts in sports law in the country, and he has, without a doubt, the strongest grasp on the legal problems involved with paying college athletes. That said, I do have some thoughts on it, and I'll be happy to share them with you. Uh, you know, college athletes in its early incarnation was uh, rooted in some high ideals, uh, the purity of amateurism, the value of sportsmanship and teamwork, uh, the goal of developing uh, uh, and maintaining a strong and healthy body. And those, those ideals probably still exist today in, in most college programs, but they've certainly been overshadowed uh, by the fact that uh, Football and basketball have evolved into this large entertainment industry with a business model that uh, generates billions of dollars and a workforce that is essentially unpaid. It's a business model that any company would embrace, I think. Uh, now, the justification for this arrangement has been that the participants, while not legally classified as employees, receive fair compensation in the form of a college education that's worth, you know, somewhere between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars over a four-year period, depending upon the institution. And the education, of course, could form the basis, potentially, of a, a lifetime uh, career in a profession or industry. Beginning in two, uh, 2015, uh, this compensation has been increased with a stipend that uh, is anywhere generally from $1,500 to $6,000 a year per athlete, and they are granted this uh, to help cover the so-called full cost of attendance. You know, I've always felt that the notion of providing a college education as fair compensation is an extremely misleading characterization of what is provided. A college scholarship typically provides a, a seat in a classroom or a lecture hall. It provides access to presentations by instructors and professors prepared for all students, access to books and materials, a dorm room, and meals. Now, those are all expenses, but in and of themselves, they don't constitute an education. Uh, most of the responsibility for achieving an education falls on the student. It requires a considerable amount of hard work, time, and intellectual effort. And with that, uh, without that on the part of the student, the scholarship isn't worth much. Uh, nobody is given an education. A scholarship is really an opportunity to achieve an education. History tells us that in many cases, I think, certainly not all, athletes, you know, because of training, practices, games, travel, have less time than many students. And in some cases, not all certainly, but in some cases arrive on campuses intellectually unprepared to do the work. Uh, in many programs, they have tutors supplied by the athletic department, but history tells us that the tutor's primary responsibility is to keep athletes eligible. That doesn't necessarily <coughs> translate into an education. So if you buy my logic here, it's, it's hard to square the revenue produced in many of the large programs. At Ohio State in 2013-14, it was $145.2 million with what's provided to the workforce. Even if you want to count the money for scholarships as real dollars, which they are not, Ohio State spent $16.8 million on scholarships. That's roughly 11% of total revenue for the people who essentially create the product. Now, typically in labor-intensive businesses, and I would uh, submit that college athletics is a labor-intensive business as to a business that is, say, highly automated. Employers pay somewhere in the area of 20 to 40 percent of their revenue to their labor force and salary, some cases as high as 60 percent. As noted earlier, this is a, a great business model. 
Now, Andrew, I know, will tell you that only a handful of athletic programs uh, show a significant operating profit, and he is correct in that assertion. But most programs have found a way to pay very high salaries to large coaching staffs and significantly upgrade facilities and stadiums. You know, there were two interesting stories that came out just this week from Clemson. Uh, and the juxtaposition of these stories, I think, is instructive. Uh, Dabo Sweeney, the uh, football coach at Clemson, had a contract uh, running for the next six years that was going to pay him roughly $3.4 million a year. Clemson tore that contract up. They weren't obligated to do so, but gave him a new contract that would pay him over $30 million for those six years, a little over $5 million a year. That's an increase for Dabo Sweeney of $1.6, $1.7 million. By 24 hours of that announcement, the Clemson Athletic Department announced that they were submitting a proposal to charge students for seats in the lower bowl at college games, <laughs> seats that were previously free to the students. And coincidentally, if approved, and it's expected it will, uh, it's expected that that will generate $1.8 million a year in revenue which will nicely cover Davo Sweeney's increase. My point being here is athletic departments are very good at raising money when they want to, and they generally find ways to do it. Uh, you know, it, it hardly seems fair, does it, uh, to the labor force that's creating this product to get such a little piece of the pie. Uh, now, uh, the solutions aren't easy, of course. I mean, simply adopting a professional sports model uh, seems difficult. Would there be a draft forcing students to attend schools that are geographically, culturally, and or academically unsuited for them? Would there be bidding wars? Would schools be forced to negotiate with you know, unproven athletes who are going to come to their school, sometimes in basketball for one year and football for three, four at the most? Uh, it, it seems it would be a chaotic situation. Uh, there have been attempts to unionize college athletes. And the argument that they are not employees certainly would be undercut by any sort of professional model. There's not been a lot of public discussion about how compensation might work because most of the debate has focused on simply whether or not athletes should be paid. But if compensation were to be uh, uh, deployed here, uh, what sort of form would it take? Now, Joe wrote a very detailed piece in the Times back in January, uh, and I'd endorse most of what he wrote there. It, it's based essentially on a salary cap model similar to what professional sports has. But uh, his proposal is a significant leap forward, and given the resistance and the plotting nature of the NCAA, it's tough to believe there will be that kind of advancement uh, in one fell swoop. I think if there's going to be advancement in this area, it's going to be incremental. The stipend was a first very small step. There's an idea here, and it's a very simple one, that could be the next step, and I'm going to refer to it as the tier model. And I'll use a football example, but obviously it could apply to basketball just as easily. Uh, and understand, this just might be a starting point. The numbers uh, might be much different, but it serves as a basis for discussion. So let's say there were four levels of payment on a college football team, tiers one, two, three, and four. Tier one would be the highest. Uh, prior to the season, an official depth chart would be classified. The first team would be tier one players, second team tier two, third team tier three, everybody else would be tier four. And let's say tier one players would be paid $30,000 annually. Tier two, 20,000, tier three, 10,000, tier four, 5,000. During the course of the season, some players would move from first team to second team. Players would move up when others were injured. Players on second teams would play more in various situations and so forth. There would be a process to account for this at the end of the season. Uh, it might take a week to accomplish, not long. There would be a salary board established. Uh, it would likely be comprised of faculty, administrators, possibly students. I'd keep coaches out of it. Uh, players would be able to come forward and make their case for additional compensation. So a defensive tackle might come forward on the second team and say, you know, I played 40% of the snaps, uh, player X was injured, there were situations where I was used regularly. The board might look at that and decide to pay him $24,000, maybe more depending on how much 40% of the snaps are represented compared to first team tackles. Uh, there's a way of adjusting salaries there incrementally. Now, as to the debate of whether or not this makes the players employees, 
Well, if the current 6,000 figure has been determined to be a stipend because it covers full cost of attendance, let's come up with some suitable label that gets around legal difficulties if that's what is going to be the problem here. So at these figures, what would this cost an athletic department? Now, let's say the average salary for a player is 20000 here. That's probably a little high given the number would be making 5000 but let's err on the, on, the, on the heavy side here. So a 100-player roster, the cost is going to be $2 million a year. That's not a lot compared to the $145.2 million that Ohio State took in. It's a little over 1%. And even if you want to add the $16.8 million scholarship cost, which are not real dollars, but let's assume they are, it still only puts labor costs at the 13% range, significantly less than most companies would employ. Now, maybe these aren't the right figures, and they're likely low for fair compensation, and they certainly aren't fair for the Heisman Trophy candidate quarterback or the All-American running back or linebacker. But something like this, I think, begins to address the unfairness in the present system. And I realize not all schools generate the revenue Ohio State does. But all the Power Five schools share in college football playoff revenue, they share in gate receipts, they have lucrative regular season deals with networks, some including the Big Ten revenue from league-owned networks. At the rate listed here, I believe the money is available. And just make one clarifying point on this, the current stipends go to all student athletes given full cost of attendance label, that, that's only fair. But the stipends I'm discussing are based on the fact that these are revenue producing sports. We're limiting this to football, men's basketball, and likely women's basketball, essentially sports with you know, national television contracts. I understand that, that other sports get some television coverage. As part of its deal, ESPN agrees to televise a number of college sports, but we should understand that those sports are simply riding the coattails of football and basketball. They're getting exposure but the viewing numbers are low and they aren't generating revenue for either the networks or the university. Likely there might be some Title IX issues certainly that would have to be addressed. As noted, the, the solutions aren't easy. Now, is this the best solution? I don't know that. Others may have better ones. Joe's is certainly more detailed and addresses a number of related issues. I'm sure he'll talk about it. But these are the sort of solutions college athletics need to begin discussing and considering. Thank you. Okay.